Hello and welcome. I'm Jan. I'm working for the Open Source Automation Development Lab. We are a German cooperative, which is basically a non-profit organization. And we do support our members in using open source in their products. So that covers many different aspects. And one important aspect for our members is real time, specifically with PrimTRT. And this is basically what I'm going to talk about within the next, let's say, 40 minutes. But today I've picked a very special context for using PrimTRT because Another topic we've seen really approaching to the embedded industrial market is virtualization and well, in, in, there's different technologies um, when it comes to virtualization, but we really see this coming to the industrial market. Um, but since on the industrial market, usually real time is a important requirement, we actually had to get a good understanding how virtualization and real time with PrimTRT can basically work together. Um, so let's have a brief look on what I'm going to talk about in this presentation. So this, this basically is three parts of my presentation. So we're going to get started with containerization. So we'll look into Docker containers and how they could behave with regards to real-time behavior. So I, I just took Docker as an example, but as you know, most of the container engines and technologies are working on the same principles. Basically, the knowledge shown here could be applied to any other container engine as well. In the second chapter, we're going to look into hardware virtualization. And specifically, I'm going to look into KVM and Jailhouse. And last but not least, when we look into um, virtualization, usually separation is a very big topic. And therefore, I would like also to have a look at how shared hardware resources, specifically a shared level two cache, could have an impact on the real-time behavior and the influence between the host and the guest operating system. So this, at the end of the day, for all the technologies we're going to talk about, I looked into three different things. So basically, I looked into the real-time behavior on the host. So that basically means just the fact that you run a few guest operating systems on that system influence the real-time behavior on the host. Second thing I looked into, is it possible to have real-time behavior within the guest system or within the guest systems? And third thing, I already mentioned that, looking into the topics of this presentation, what is the level of isolation? Once again, this is pretty important to look into because when, when people start to look into virtualization, in many cases, the motivation of using virtualization techniques is to have a level of separation or isolation for different uh, parts of their system, and therefore it was crucial to look into that as well. Well, we're going to start with containerization. And before we dig a bit deeper in my test setup, just let's briefly remember on what PreemptRT does. Just a very brief and simplified overview. So for those of you that haven't worked with PreemptRT so far, PreemptRT is a so-called single kernel approach, which means it makes Linux itself capable of free time, basically by introducing a additional preemption model, which is fully preemptible kernel. So that means that a real-time task, in comparison to other solutions for Linux and real-time, is just a standard Linux task. So basically, you need nothing special. You just work with the standard C library, with the standard tools, standard POSIX API. It's a standard Linux task. You just need to follow a few rules. But now, since a real-time task is just another Linux task, if we now look into the topic of containers in real time, well, you know, a container is well, also with a simplified view, just a set of processes that is running in an isolated environment. So um, since a real-time task is just a normal Linux task, any process inside a container can have real-time priority. So there's no problem with, uh, with that. So and this is basically what we did to evaluate the real-time behavior. Um, so we put... Actually, we took one system out of our so-called QA farm, where we do latency monitoring on roughly 200 boards. Um, actually, you could access these systems if you go to osadl.org, just um, go to QA farm real time, and you pick rec zero slot two, you'll feel, will find the test hardware. And on this hardware, I just put a Docker container and on the host and in the container, I'm just running the 
real-time smoke test tool, cyclic test to evaluate the real-time behavior. So th this is basically what we did. If you want to learn more about like the um, load scenarios we're using and how the tests are really looking, just go to osadl.org and check the QA farm for slightly more details. Okay, um, if you haven't worked with cyclic tests before, just to give you a rough idea on how you could use that to evaluate the real-time behavior of your system, um, cyclic tests is at the end of the day a pretty simple tool that just gives you the possibility to start a given number of threads that will wake up at a given interval, let's say like 200 microseconds. So every time one of these measurement threads wakes up, it will just um, take the current system time and compare it to the time when you want it to wake up. You calculate the delta and then you know the wake up latency. And this latency is continuously reported to a master process that would monitor the worst case latency for you or could I create a nice histogram for you and so on and so on. So this is, this is pretty simple and this is pretty much what Cyclic does. Thus setting up a given number of threads that will wake up in a given interval. And this is basically what we used. But yeah, so this is, this is how it would look like, simple command line tool. There's just a few parameters you would give, like the interval to wake up, the priority, the number of threads on which CPUs you want to run. And um, most importantly, it would tell you the worst case latency that you have reached over the runtime. It, this is basically the number you're interested in, right? So what, what's the worst case you could, you could see in different load scenarios? Well, before we dig a bit deeper in my test setup, it might sound simple, but to understand the tests a bit more, we need to remember a few key principles when it comes to setting up a real-time system, right? So first of all, once again, it might sound pretty simple, but it is crucial to understand and crucial to follow. So if I want to guarantee real-time behavior, the corresponding real-time task needs during its entire runtime the highest priority, right, of all tasks running on the same core. Because otherwise, you know, we might get interrupted and that might violate our timeline. So sounds simple, but we need to remember that. If you want to optimize things a bit further, we could also to we could restrict a task to run on a particular core and we could even isolate that core from additional noise right, to, to improve the latencies. So th these are two important points, but number one is the most important one. And these general principles also apply if you like talk about real-time and virtual environments. So we need to think about that. So the, the main message here is that I cannot just blindly deploy virtual machines with real-time workload and just think it works because I have a real-time kernel working, right? So I need the overall picture and make sure that I do not overcommit the system, right? So this can be simply shown with cyclic test, just to um, give you an idea of what I, I wanted to tell here. Um, I know that this might look a bit stupid, but it tells pretty much about the principles, what I just wanted to tell. So in this case, I'm starting 12 tasks um, with an interval of 100 microseconds, all running on the same core with decreasing priority, right? So all these real-time uh, applications are running on the same core. And as you can see with the increasing number of tasks and the decreasing priority, we see that the worst case latency that is being reported gets worse and worse and worse. So what's the reason for that? because the higher gets the chance that they get interrupted and they violate their timeline. So at the end of the day, what we pretty much did here, we just heavily overcommitted the system. So it just doesn't work. So once again, you need to really think about the design of your real-time system, just randomly deploy any workload and enable real-time. Well, that just doesn't work, right? And the same we need to do in a virtualized environment. So what's the fix in this um, situation? Well. I could just ask cyclic test to like run all the tasks on a separate CPU. I, I'm back to the key principles, right? I'm the highest priority task during my entire runtime. I won't get interrupted and I can meet my timelines. So that's pretty much it. And this is what we also applied to our test setup. So this is a bit of zoom in on the test setup I showed you. Um, it's been an eight core machine. So as you can see, I've reserved four cores on the host to run cyclic tests on it, and another four cores within the container to run cyclic tests in there as well. And well, 
when running cyclic tests, we've just made sure that they are running on dedicated CPUs and there's no overlap between the host and the guest. Once again, this is just because we need to follow the key principles when designing a real-time system, right? So we had a proper partitioning, and for all technologies I'm showing in this presentation, we had to apply this key principle that you have a, a proper partitioning of the overall system, right? Well, now you might be interested in the results we've reached. So this is the latency histogram of the cyclic test run on the Docker host. Um, looks actually pretty nice. We've, we've seen a worst case for case of 30 microseconds, and all the tests always did run in parallel. So a cyclic test was running in the container and the host, right? So what we can tell with that is that just the fact that we have some real-time load running in the container doesn't have any influence on the host. So there's no interference right here, which is already good news, right? So let's look at the guest. And as we can see, it looks pretty much the same. So, I mean, we've been at 26 microseconds, which is the same area as we reached on the host. Like, also the distribution of the latencies looks pretty much the same, which is, at the end of the day, not surprising, because it's just a bunch of processes running in an isolated environment, so there's no root cause for additional latencies, right? So, which is proved with these measurements. So, these measurements were running under heavy CPU load. And now, um, in the QA farm, we do different load scenarios. So sometimes you cause latencies with load, sometimes with an idle system because you hit any weird power management issue, you enter C states or whatever. So therefore, we also have um, idle measurements. And actually, this um, we messed up a little, little detail in the configuration. That's something I wanted to share with you, uh, this experience. So this is the idle measurement on the host which is in the same area. Like we see 29 microseconds, so the, even the distribution looks pretty much the same as under heavy load. Then we looked into the measurements in the idle Docker container. And oops, that looks a bit different, actually looked a bit different, and we've been really surprised on what happened here. Um, just to zoom in, in for better reading, I mean, we hit 93 microseconds in the container compared to 20 something on the host. And I mean, that doesn't make any sense at all. So why should the idle scenario have an influence on the container? So the thing is that, I mean, at the end of the day, the, the thing you need to be careful about is that the container needs the appropriate privileges and it needs to have access to the required system resources, right? So the configuration, it's not hard, but it's a bit tricky, and you need to take care about a few things. So what happened here is it's actually pretty simple. Um, we didn't have access to a specific device node, which is used to disable the C states. So what happened at the end of the day is the host did have access, so C states were disabled on the host measurement, but the guest didn't have access to this device node, so C states were not disabled, so the, the measurements at the end of the day were not comparable, right? So these worst-case latencies have been triggered, but just by coming back from a, from a C state, right? So uh, we fixed that in the setup. And as you can see, also with the idle measurement, we've been back to the native host latency. I mean, it, it, it's pretty simple, right? Nothing, nothing unexpected, but nice to see that it's actually quite easy to, to run a real-time application within a container. So these are the numbers, already quite quite good news. The next topic we wanted to look into, I told you, is the level of isolation. So how can, so is there any possibility that the host system could influence the real-time behavior on the guest and the other way around? Just think about a, well, misbehaving driver, a bugging, buggy driver with locking issues, disabling interrupts, whatever. And this is something we wanted to emulate with a driver um, which is called Bloxys. Um, we basically wrote Bloxys to break things. Um, that's, that's pretty much what Bloxys does. So um, at the end of the day, it's a very small driver. It just blocks the system for a given number of cycles just by disabling preemption and local IRQ processing. That's pretty much it. So it's, it's just basically to, to introduce artificial latencies to a system and, see, and monitor the behavior then, right? And this is pretty much what we, what we also did in this setup. So we've been using Bloxys to, to emulate a misbehaving driver. And um, well, 
So we introduced this um, Bloxys uh, scenario on the host while the measurements have been running on both systems, right? So just, I mean, it's quite obvious if I load that driver, block the system, I mean, you see we've been blocking for roughly four milliseconds, it just breaks the system completely, right? Now you could do a guess, a wild guess, what happens to the guest system. I mean, we know how containers working. I introduced the noise on the host, I just load the driver. But I mean, I think it is obvious that this disturbance from the host system directly makes it straight to the container, right? Because I mean, they are sharing the, the, the same operating system kernel, right? So if I block that, I mean, it has a clear influence on the host and the guest. So at the end of the day, the recap would be that the, I mean, you can have native latencies, native host latencies in the guest, but the level of separation has its limitations, right, for the container setup. So that would be the brief summary. Well, going to the next topic, switching from containerization to hardware virtualization. So one obvious technology we had to look into together with preempt RT was uh, KVM. Uh, so also I did these measurements on a x86 platform. So basically Core i7, um, six core machine, I reserved three cores for the host, three for the guest. And there's a few things you need to know how to set things up. So it's a bit like setting up KVM for real time. It's not impossible, but it's, it, it's a bit tricky, right? Um, there's a few hints, I, so we have limited time. So what, what I could recommend to you is this, what I've been using this uh, TuneD profiles from Reddit for real-time virtual host and real-time virtual guest. I, like, I took these as an inspiration on the, on the settings that are recommended. So if you want to look into some further details and what you could tweak on KVM, I would highly recommend to you to look into the TuneD profiles from Reddit. But most importantly, remember about the, what I told you about the proper partitioning of the system, right? So what I had to do is to get the cores for the guest system isolated. So th there's a few ways you could do that. So I just took the simple way to do this on the command line, basically isolating the CPUs, enabling no hertz full, and like doing the IRQ routing in a way that they won't hit the guest operating system. So by default, routing the IRQs to the host CPU. So th this is pretty much the main setup, trying to get as much noise as possible away from the guest operating system. So this is the first step. Uh, second step, you need to configure QEMU so that you could tell where the vCPUs are running. So then you, you want to make sure that the vCPUs are really running on the three cores we have isolated for that purpose. Um, so you, you could easily do that with a word manager in the CPU tuning section. So there's a pinning you could do for the vCPUs. Um, you could also tell that for a specific set of vCPUs, like you want to change the um, scheduling policy. So in this case, I just put it to SCID 5 to priority one. So be a bit careful with the RT priority here. So I put RT priority, but on a very low level, because the thing is that the vCPU will run more than just real-time load rate. So if you just would put a randomly high uh, real-time priority, you might have a risk to starve out some um, housekeeping thread, which is still running on one of the isolated CPUs. So recommendation would basically be take SCID 5 put it on a real-time priority. That, that's basically how people do it, right? So these are the most important settings. Like I mentioned, there's also on the host a few KVM tweaks you could do. I mean, KVM is really flexible. So there's, there's so many use cases for KVM. Um, so it, it needs a while, time, some time to figure out what you really need to do. So once again, if you want to see what's really important, look at the TuneD profiles from Headed. So they have the most important settings you need to, you need to do. So this was pretty much the summary of the setup we did. Um, measurements were pretty much the same on the host and guest. We've been using cyclic tests with the exactly same load scenarios, and we looked how was the real-time behavior. So, um, looking at the host latency. Also, this machine was behaving quite nice. Host latency of 26 microseconds. Worst case, pretty, pretty small distributions of the latencies. So also here, we could tell that just the fact that we run the guest operating system and we do random load in the guest operating system does not influence the real-time behavior on the host at all, which is already good news. 
And this is already a, a pretty common use case because there's in the industry actually use cases where you just use the host system for real time and you want to just run a random other operating system just doing your HMI. So you have your HMI and the real time system on one controller, right? So for this use case, we could already prove that this is really working, just running the guest doesn't have any real bad influence on the host system. Well, there's, there's bad things you could do, you cannot avoid. We'll talk about that later in the presentation. So this is the host system. So before I switch to the next slide, don't be scared. It looks slightly worse, <laughs> which I can announce. But give me some time. We're going to have a closer look, because it's, it's not as bad as it might look at the first glance, right? Um, OK, hold on a sec. So this is um, what, I, what I did in several measurements within the guest. But let's go over that one by one, because if you look at the, uh, you see that the three V CPUs right here. So most interestingly, CPU zero did behave quite well. So I, I was really able to get most of the noise back out of from, from that V CPU. So we've hit a worst case, which was roughly in the area of 50 microseconds, slower than the host. But I mean, I didn't had, uh, hit any latencies in many different measurements, which was more than these, like 50 microseconds. But what's obvious is that um, I wasn't able to, to get rid of some noise on the other Wii CPUs, which was causing some latencies here. So the CPU 1 was like at roughly 200 microseconds. And CPU 2, most interestingly, you see these three peaks. So there's, um, like, there's a pattern in here, right? So like these are in like a distance of 100 microseconds should, should, should be easy to, to trace down the root cause, which I haven't done so far. Uh, most probably still a, a configuration issue. It is, um, like from experience, what I could tell, um, it is possible to, to isolate the vCPUs and have real-time response in the guest, but you really need to look that you get the, the noise from the vCPUs and configuration is a bit tricky, right? So just to compare that, um, there's another measurement which I actually messed up, another detail. So um, I did one test run where I forgot to enable no hot full, right? And just look at the distribution of the latencies in the guest. I mean, it's like really going a bit wider on all CPUs. So I mean, that, that easily tells that it's really important to get as most as noise as possible away from the vCPUs, right? But it, it's not impossible, right? So it is at the end of the day that the conclusion would be with the proper configuration and accepting a few limitations. You can have real-time response in the guest, but configuration is a bit tricky, right? Other topic we need to look into, isolation. Like what I, exactly the same I did with the Docker setup. So just blocking the system on the host and the guest, just imagine you have a misbehaving driver. Once again, we emulate that behavior and see what could be the influence. So first try was, I mean, also seems to be obvious here, if I block the system on the host, I mean, it's, it's quite clear that it makes it straight to the host and the guest, right? Because at the end of the day, I'm just completely blocking the, the hypervisor right here, right? So this will just make it straight to the guest operating system. The interesting question is, looking at the misbehavior in the guest operating system, um, does that make it through to the host? And um, this is actually not the case. So having this weird behavior in the guest doesn't influence the real-time latencies on the host. So even if the guest is really misbehaving, doing really bad things, the host is still working, right? So at the end of the day, Isolation is way higher, right? It's clear if I block the hypervisor, then it breaks things for all. But if the guests are misbehaving, I have a very high level of isolation with KVM, right? So talking about the level of isolation, there was another technology we really had to look into when talking about this topic. Um, this is a project which is called Jailhouse. Um, it's a partitioning hypervisor. It's GPL v2 only, was originally written by Siemens, still maintained by Siemens, basically supports x86 and uh, ARM. And just like KVM, it makes use of the virtualization features of modern CPUs, right? Um, and it does a real hard partitioning of the system. So once again, time is a bit limited in this presentation. In the 
slide version I have uploaded. There's a few additional slides for you, just if you want to do some further reading on what Chillhouse could do and what it can't do and so on. Um, so I'm going to skip these in the presentation right now. So the uploaded version of the slides is a bit more extended. Um, but I think I can explain a bit on how Chailhouse works with the, with the setup I've picked. So I did the measurements on a IMX8 MP quad-core CPU, and then I started partitioning the system. And what you basically do with Chailhouse, first of all, you boot a Linux system, and then you inject the driver, which is Chailhouse KO, and this basically kicks off the hypervisor. And then the hypervisor can take over. So the, the system you initially booted is what we call the root cell. The root cell is a completely working system. I chose that I just dedicate two CPUs to the root cell, and I equip the root cell with a RT patched system. Out of the root cell, you can now start to create the guest operating systems. Um, in Shalehouse, these are called inmates, and on the second CPU, I just created another inmate running Linux with preempt RT. So I've had two independent Linux systems running. I mean, from the user's perspective, this really looks like you would have two different boards on your desk, right? So these systems are running independently. You could even crash the root cell, and the inmate would still keep running, right? So the, the system is really physically partitioned. And just to give some additional noise here, I've started a bare metal application on the last CPU just to see if that could have also any bad influence on the preempt RT systems running. So once again, we've had two preempt RT systems running, one on the host, one on the guest, measurements taken in parallel. So this would basically be the, the view from the root cell just asking the hypervisor which operating systems are running. So also here, we did all the measurements with a cyclic test. Let's look at the Result. So this is the um, latencies on the host system. So we ended up with like 45 microseconds um, worst case latency, which is pretty much what I would expect from this IMX8. So pretty, pretty good latencies here. Now drum roll. How does it look in the guest operating system? And this looked actually really, really good. Um, Actually, slightly smaller, but at the end of the day, the worst case latency is pretty much in the same area than on the host. So we, we really, in all of the measurements we did, we reached native host latencies within the guest operating system. So with Shalehouse, we could say that, I mean, just running the guest doesn't have any influence on the host, and we could even in the guest have native host latency. So once again, it's it's completely partitioned system, right? So these systems are running completely independently. And that brings us back to the question, well, then how does it look like with the level of separation, right? So if I do the same game with the Bloxys driver, like just emulating a misbehaving driver, so how does that look like? Just uh, injecting the noise on the host, you could actually see that even if the root cell is disturbed, the guest doesn't see any influence on that, right? So now we, we, we could really see that the host is completely independent. I, actually, I could even crash the root cell. The guest would keep running, right? So we have a very, very high level of separation here with this, right? So before we start with the next chapter, let's briefly summarize, looking into the technologies. I mean, what, what we could basically say is that with all technologies, we came to the conclusion that you could have real-time behavior in the guest. Um, for KVM, it was a bit tricky to configure, you might need to accept a few constraints, but at the end of the day, it's, it's, it's doable. With the real-time latencies for Shalehouse, for Docker, we pretty much hit the host latencies. For KVM, well, there might be worse latencies in the guest operating system, right? Um, looking at the separation, for Docker, it was very limited for obvious reasons, right? For KVM, remember, in one direction, we could get a disturbance, in the other not. So we had a very high level of separation looking at the guest operating system, and with Shalehouse, it was really excellent, right? So we had complete isolation of the system. But does this bring us to a complete independence of the host system? 
And well, you see a no for all three technologies we've been evaluating here. Now the question right, would be, why? Because I just told you, at least with a hypervisor like Shalehouse, you have a very high level of separation. So why do I tell you right now that you cannot get complete independence from host? The main reason is it really depends on your hardware, what you could really do. And this is why we also looked a bit into the impact on shared hardware resources here. So because if you have, I mean, we just separated the CPUs, right? But there are still resources, at least on the ARM architecture we've been using. So this is a different one. But I mean, just to, to uh, visualize, there are hardware resources that are shared, like the level two cache, right? And just to try to figure out what impact that really could have, I just picked another board out of our QA farm with a quad core, a Cortex A53, um, 500 kilobytes of shared level two cache. And um, I just tried to stress it a bit and see what influence this could have on the behavior. So this is basically how the system looks without any, uh, any memory stressing, quite okay. So we have a worst case latency usually on the board I've picked of 100 microseconds. Now what I did was, as always, I've been running cyclic test on all the four CPUs. Just remember, usually the latency was in the area of 100 microseconds. The only thing now which I did in addition was, I've been using stress in Qi, um, doing some weird allocations on just one of the four CPUs, not on all, right? You could see I, I've set, um, the stressors running on CPU zero, running one malloc stressor with in maximum 32 allocations running in parallel, just doing memory allocations in a very high frequency. And as you could see, I've been really bad. So I just picked the, exactly the cache size for the, for the size of the allocation. And the, the impact you could actually see here is that I'm doing the load on CPU zero but it has definitely a very significant impact on all on the other CPUs. Like the latency is going up the six times the number you usually would see, right? And th this is like why I told there's no complete separation or separation is really depending on your hardware because there's not actually not much you could do in that scenario. And this could actually be any unprivileged process that could do the, the memory access, that, which once again brings me to the point you cannot just randomly deploy a workload and expect real time to work, right? You need to have a knowledge of the overall system and also how your hardware works, right? There's different hardware that could that handle differently, but in this case, well, there's no workaround. Um, just to prove this theory that this is caused by the shared last level cache, um, I picked a different CPU. Um, this was um, a IMX8 Quad Max, which has two CPU clusters. And the, the cache is always just shared on one CPU cluster, right? So we have um, four Cortex-A53 and two Cortex-A73, and both have a like separated cache, right? So I did, once again, the, the same stressing with the memory, right? So, but basically the stressing was running just on the Cortex-A53, right? On two of the cores, which basically, it's obvious also right here, the latencies are going up to a very high value. So on that CPU, I usually also see values of way less than 100 microseconds, right? Um, so there, there is a significant impact, but as you could see on the other CPU cluster, there's actually no effect right here because they have a separate level two cache, right? So this is a pretty nice example on how shared hardware resources could really have an impact on the behavior. Could be the latency, could be the runtime, whatever. I mean, the, the, the caches is really, a, big source for performance, right? So if you mess that up, you're in trouble. Okay, so that pretty much brings me to the summary of the presentation. So first of all, let's summary the, thank you. <laughs> <coughs> that brings me pretty much to the uh, summary of uh, the real-time capabilities. So we've learned that a gas system may have real-time capabilities. Depends a bit on the technology you are using. For containers, we've learned they can have the same latencies as the host. For KVM, we've seen that the guest may have longer latencies. And for jailhouse, we've also seen that we have the same latencies on the host. But in any case, what we've just learned, keep in mind that shared hardware resources can really have a significant impact on what's happening and on the level of separation. Well, summary with respect to the separation, um, well, 
We obviously learned that the guest system well, may or may not be separated from the host. Depends on the technology you're using, right? Um, with containers, they are, well, based on how they are working, not well separated. Full hardware virtualization guests with KVM may provide separation on a high degree. So we've seen that having a misbehaving driver in the guest doesn't have any influence on the ghost. So we have a very high level of separation. And last but not least, with Shalehouse, well, we've had a very high level of separation, right? So we could even crash the guest or the host, and the other system would still keep running. We don't see any influence on the latencies. But once again, also shared hardware resources in that setup could also lead to a significant different behavior when it comes to runtime and latencies. So that's pretty much it, what I wanted to tell. Thank you so much for attending my presentation, and I would now be happy to answer your questions. Hi, thank you for the presentation. Uh, so one of our project, we see the similar issue that the shared cache has a significant impact yeah. on the latency. So other than the clustering, did you, did you have any suggestion that uh, we could also do in our project? Because we tried with the clustering, and that works. That's a good thing. But uh, we couldn't uh, manage to handle the shared one without clustering. Yeah, it, it, it depends a little bit on the architecture you're using. Um, you might want to check really if there might be a possibility even to, to color the caches or lock something, um, which is not possible on the A53, right? Um, in theory, at least the ARMv8 spec has a feature which is called a cache lockdown, where you could like just lock a specific area. But to be honest, I, up to now, I didn't find any SOC was really implemented, right? Um, so that, that would be a solution. So, But really check on your SOC if there might be some some cache configuration that you could probably use. Apart from that, there's not much more you could probably do in really looking at the, at the software design, avoid random memory allocations. I mean, in, in this case, I've been really bad to the system, right? I'm just allocating the, exactly the cache size. Um, just avoid th this kind of behavior, but there's not much more you could actually do than looking into the architecture. So it's not that you conf could configure the system and you could deploy any random load. But once again, check what your hardware can really really do. But apart from that, there's unfortunately no recommendation I can give on that one. Um, I, I think in Jailhouse, they implement some cache coloring te technique. Uh, did you try your test with no, so no. that uh, virtual machine are isolated on the cache level? No, actually, I, I, I did not try that at all. Because maybe it could solve the, this such issue? Uh, it, it, it can limit, but once again, it is highly dependent on what you could really do on the hardware level. Okay, thank but, you. But once again, in this scenario, I didn't, didn't try that out. Questions, maybe from remote, one, one here. Yeah, uh, one question regarding your KVM case and the Bloxys. Did you run the Bloxys on all three virtual machines or did you just run it in one virtual machine and did that influence the other two? Um, I had, actually I did one run where I had two virtual machines running, not just uh, one and like it, I, I couldn't see any influence between the guests when Bloxys was running in the guest, but definitely I always saw the influence just making it straight to the guest when I was running on the host, which once again makes makes sense. Hope that answered the question. We're out of time. So, thank you. Okay, thank you guys. Thank you.